Hello and welcome to Dream Deals. On tonight's show, Chris Goffey tests Honda's latest 200 brake horsepower Civic Type R. Plus, we'll be taking a look at a true 60s icon, the Jaguar E-Type, and finding out how Porsche's latest 911 Carrera 4 handles on the racetrack. But first, it's time to find out just how far TVR has come with the latest Tuscan S. In those golden days of yesteryear, Britain had a fantastic tradition for building sports cars. But then somehow, along the way, our car building companies have either been lost or have been bought out by the huge multinationals. And for a while, it looked like our car building heritage was going to be lost forever. But then, in the early 1980s, car company TVR took the bull by the horns and offered us a new breed of sports car. Combining a back-to-basics driving experience with beautiful and contemporary styling, there's no doubt that TVR with a new face at the British car industry, and maybe the saviour of sports cars. And this is their latest design, the TVR Tuscan S. Now, without doubt, this is the most adventurous design to come from TVR, and it's certainly one of the most stunning cars that you'll see on the road. The whole design here, the way the bonnet swoops down into these air intakes, down at the front, it's very low, very purposeful, and there's no bumper as such, just this very aggressive drilled front grille. And those headlights, well, they look like something more from an Aliens film than something you get on a sports car. Now, when you move down the side of the Tuscan, you're greeted by these massive 18-inch seven-spoke alloys, and in there, huge, whopping vented brake discs. This is definitely a supercar. But the bit that I really love about it is the way all these curves Whilst they intercut one another, it all still flows right from the front, right down to the back. Now, there are quite a few motoring manufacturers out there that do great jobs when they design the body shell, but with the interior, it's as if they couldn't be bothered. Well, not TVR. And before you run off, how's about that for keyless entry? Just like the exterior, in here it is phenomenal. Those Blackpool boys have surpassed themselves. The interior of this car is a designer's dream. Forget your Japanese black plastic. Every switch, button and dial has been handcrafted for the Tuscan. So can this car possibly get any better? We ain't even started. Engine-wise, we've got a straight six with 390 brake horsepower, which is it's the stuff of dreams. And that sound, it's just brilliant. I haven't even started to push it yet. That, this is just excellent. Now, unlike many of the supercars from the Fatherland, we haven't got any traction control or any sort of fancy electronics in that respect. But as Ben, the guy from TVR, said, you don't really need it because this car's traction control is the accelerator pedal. Now, that's not as daft as it sounds. It's got a very, very long throw on it. So basically, if you don't want to go that fast, you don't push it that fast. It's very, very solid as well under my foot here. But when you do want to go a bit, you just put it down and you take it off. That's just remarkable. However many performance cars or just cars in general that you drive, you can never tire of an exhaust note like that. A lot of people sound long journeys with these sort of cars. It gets boring, it's annoying, it's too much of a drone. But nah, not for me. That is just absolutely fabulous. And if you do want to uh, Turn the volume up a bit, just put your foot down. Oh, that's like a symphony orchestra. That's fantastic. Now, because TVR are a small independent company, it means that they've got complete autonomy over the designs. That's obviously apparent from the outside and from the interior. But it's the little things like the fuel gauge and the water temperature gauge, brass, it's aluminium. If you tried to do that in a Ford or a BMW, they would laugh at you and they'd probably sack you. I don't know about its limits, because I'm not about to try it out on the Blackburn Moors. 
but it does just feel so precise. Loads of confidence you get from those huge tyres. There is loads of grip. I know it's a, a rear wheel drive car, it's a damp road, so I'm going to be taking it easy anyway. But it just feels really safe, very solid, and just bloody enjoyable. It's not often that you do a, a car test and your face aches from uh, your face aches from smiling. In fact, I've got to say something bad about the car because that's what motoring journalists always do. So I've got to say, yeah, it gave me cramp in my cheeks. <laughs> Come on. Absolutely awesome. There is no other word to describe this car. But do you know what the best bit is? It is 100% British, right down to every last nut and bolt. We might be rubbish at cricket, we might be a load of moaning old so-and-so, so we might have rubbish weather. But when it comes down to making sports cars, that puts us on the map. Who's your daddy? Earlier in the series, we tested Porsche's latest 911 Turbo. Now it's time to find out how its little brother, the Carrera 4, handles the twists and turns of the racetrack. Back in the 1980s, we had some horrible fashions. We had some very nasty music. And we also had a group of people that were called yuppies. But what did a yuppie want to do with his wads of cash? He wanted to buy one of these. Today we're at Alton Park in Cheshire to find out exactly what this car can do. Now the 911 has been accused of being too grown up, so surely the Carrera 4 must be the sensible of all Porsches. The engine produces a rather hefty 300 brake horsepower, enough to hit 60 from standstill in just a shade over five seconds, and it will take you flying up to a wonderful 175 miles an hour. From being a little nipper, the Porsche 911 was always the car I wanted. That was the dream car for me. I just loved the way it looked, the way it sounded. And uh, not so long ago, a pal of mine bought a 993. Fantastic car, makes a wonderful noise. That air-cooled engine's just fantastic. And they bring out the 996, the one we're in today is the Carrera 4. And let me tell you, with the state of the, uh, the circuit today, the Carrera 4 makes a hell of a difference. You need that four-wheel drive to pull out the bends. Cost-cutting means that the 911 has got to share a few parts with its smaller sister, the Boxster. And like it or not, this means your 60 grand supercar looks a lot like a £35,000 Boxster. Well, from the front anyway. Doesn't really bother me, but I won't be surprised if some potential buyers felt a little bit differently. The only thing for me with this car at the moment is the fact that it's just not making that noise. The noise that I used to love about the Porsche, that growl. But having said that, it drives very well. It's a, it's a refined version of the 993, I reckon. Certainly with a four wheel drive, you can come in and out of bends so nicely. You can brake very late. You can pull out the bends with a lot of acceleration and you don't feel like the car's going to give anything. You just know that it's just going to grip to the road and it's going to pull away. I'm having a lot of fun. Well, the yuppies may have been left behind in the 80s, but not so the 911. Now nearly 40 years old, the 911 continues to offer an unmatchable combination of looks, performance and drivability. If your purse strings won't loosen enough to get hold of the 911 Turbo, then the Carrera 4 is not a bad car to settle for. At just under £60,000, the Carrera isn't cheap, but what do you get for your money? It's a practical sports car that will always be in fashion, unlike the yuppie. Well, that's it for part one, but join us after the break when we'll be seeing how Honda's new Civic Type R handles the twists and turns of the Isle of Man. The superbly beautiful background of the centre of the Isle of Man. Spiritually, a very important place for Honda of Japan because old Mr. Honda came to this island in the 1940s 
to watch motorcycle racing. And he decided from his garage in his back garden, he could build a motorcycle to take on the rest of the world. And the rest, as we know, is history. Well, today, Honda have come back to the Isle of Man for the launch of this car, the new Civic Type R. A very important car for Honda because it's the first one they're going to build in their factory in England at Swindon that's going to be on sale in Japan. This is the new Civic in three-door form. It's been stiffened, lowered, huge 17-inch wheels with 7J rims, big fat tyres, huge ventilated disc brakes, as you'd expect. But the heart of the new Civic Type R is, as always, the engine. 2 litres, 200 brake horsepower, intelligent variable valve timing, and that's enough to take it to a maximum of almost 150 miles an hour and 0 to 60 in around six and a half seconds. A seriously quick little car. First impressions when you set off are these rally style seats that really do hug you around the shoulders and the hips and hold you firm in spirited cornering. Nice instrument layout, nice clear instruments, a rev counter red lined at 8,000 RPM, which is encouraging. Of course, that's always been one of the great strengths of these Honda engines, that you can drive the car very slowly, you can drive it smoothly, uh, you can drive it in a high gear and it'll pull from quite low revs but it really doesn't reveal its true character until the revs climb up to around the four and a half thousand mark and then things start happening. As you'd expect with these ultra low profile tyres, the low speed ride is quite lumpy and the car is disturbed by potholes and road imperfections. But as soon as the pace picks up, the Civic is beautifully poised on the road. Super steering is perfectly weighted. The car responds instantaneously to any input and you can place it to the inch on the road. And that wailing engine note as it goes between seven and 8,000 revs, just intoxicating. The engine wails away at 7,000, 8,000 revs. The big, fat, sticky tyres just grip and grip. And these huge ventilated discs with ABS really work. An open road on the Isle of Man mountain. What more could you ask for? It's no surprise that Honda are applying for full FIA Group N homologation for this car for a racing series in 2002. And they say it'll need remarkably few modifications to turn it into a racer. As a road car, it makes a great deal of sense. 16,000 pounds is not expensive. When you look at the tremendous performance, it comes in any color you like, as long as it's red, black, or silver. And for someone who wants a practical, reliable, everyday transport that won't disgrace you on a track day, look no further. The 1960s will always be looked upon as a time when England was the style capital of the world. There was the miniskirt, the Beatles, and of course, the Jaguar E-Type. I wonder how many people at its launch thought that 40 years later, it would still be as popular. So what kind of people own this classic? People like myself, I think anybody if they had the opportunity, but uh, it's just enjoying driving them. Obviously you don't use it as your first car, you, it's just a fun car, but uh, I think a lot of people would like one, but uh, it's garaging them and uh, running them. 
so would Colin recommend the E-Type experience and how does it compare to other cars? Oh yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people would like them, you know, it's just, it's, it's funny actually because when I go and park up the guys of 60 are the ones that talk to you because 30 years ago they had them and they were only Jack the Lad then so yeah I think anybody would drive one. Well I've had Ferraris, MGBs obviously but uh, obviously the MGB is a classic but the Ferraris and the Mercs and the, the XK8 which is I've got now it's you can't really compare them to a classic you know this one is lovely to drive modern cars drive themselves I think. Now with the car being 40 years old, good examples are going to be hard to find. So what did Colin pay for his example and are parts difficult to find, should something go wrong? When I bought it I paid 25 for it, 25 grand, but what it's worth is what people will pay. Like say for your Beckhams and people with lots of money, if they want an E-Type and a nice one they'll give you plenty of money, but it depends. There's a place I go to, uh, there's a couple of advertising in Jag Enthusiast and uh, they're very good, they'll send them by carrier and uh, obviously if it's something big you go for it yourself but no, there is a lot of places where you can get them. Despite its age, the E-Type is still as popular as ever. It might be 40 years old but its sheer style and presence make it just as desirable now. Unless you've been on Mars for the last couple of years, you'll be aware that it's been an up and down time for Rover. Being bought out by BMW, then dropped like a stone. They were left struggling for survival and the future looked grim. Then at the Geneva Motor Show, we saw the cars that were the light at the end of the tunnel. Hail the return of Z cars. There are three new MG models, the ZR, ZS and ZT, and although they share the same body shells of the Rover models, there is not much else to tempt Grandad out of his smoking chair. No, these new MGs are firmly aimed at the boy or girl racer in you. I'm driving the middle of the range ZS. Middle of the range, but definitely not middle of the road. The shell is based on the Rover 400, but there have been extensive changes to the suspension, the chassis, and the V6 has been nicked from the Freelander. Oh, and in case you didn't notice, there's been a bit of an image makeover with the body kit. From any angle, the MG looks like a balls out sports saloon. Front splitter, side skirts, 17 inch alloys, big bore exhaust with chrome heat shield. And the boy racer's calling card, a huge rear spoiler. MG have certainly not pulled any punches with their new image. drive hard. Well first impressions definitely. First of all for the noisy bit, the engine. What's unusual about a car this size is that it's got a V6 which means backs of torque. You can have the 1.8k series but for out and out sports performance I go for the 2.5 litre 180 brake horsepower unit. Not to 60 time is a rapid 7.3 seconds and it'll take you on to just under 140 miles an hour with a pretty good fuel consumption of a combined 30 miles to the gallon. Now another essential ingredient to a sports car is a cracking gearbox and again the ZS supplies. It's tight, it's notchy and although the clutch might be a bit heavy it's still a great gearbox to use. I've got to say, the ride is brilliant. The car feels solid, poised and balanced on the road and for a little over £16,000, I think that's pretty impressive. If I'm being really picky, I think that the steering is slightly light, but saying that, you do still get a lot of feedback through the steering wheel.
Now you'll have guessed by now that I'm really impressed with this car, but there are a few things that I think they could improve on. Firstly, the body styling. Now, whilst it looks striking, it also looks like an Essex boy has given his Rover 400 a good max powering in his garage. He looks a bit bolted on. And as for this rear spoiler, it might be good for the aerodynamics, but it's also good for blocking your rear view, especially on the motorways. Watch out for those policemen sneaking up behind you. And the other area that could be improved is the interior. And although the door trims and the gear lever are stylish, the rest of the car is a far cry from the boy racer exterior. It's a little bit old Rover. MG will argue that it's only £16,000, but SEAT can do a great interior job on just a 14 grand Leon. I've yet to drive the other two MG saloons, but I have a feeling they're going to be really impressive. You know, MG have taken the knocks on the chin and they've gone forwards to produce a fantastic car in the ZS, whether you're a fan of the looks or not. Whilst the long-term future still isn't secure for MG Rover, with them aiming their cars at younger, sportier drivers, and with MG's racing heritage, they're in with a fighting chance. And let's hope they succeed, because I don't think anyone in the world would want to lose the MG Octagon forever. That's it for this programme, but make sure you join us next week when we'll be matching up two of the greatest rally cars of all time, the Mitsubishi Evo and the Audi Quattro. Plus, we'll be testing one of today's most popular sports coupes, the Audi TT.